Tone indicators, a new standard of online communication, are an interesting linguistic phenomena as they're very revealing of how different groups of people react to organic social changes. This new social norm is most popular with autistic individuals such as myself, and it's people outside of these groups that tend to be the loudest in regards to negative feedback. While it's easy for most to write the naysayers off as one of the usual online annoyances, I think their behaviors show how social progress is met with a predictable pattern of resistance from those who tend to suffer from egocentrism. But let's back up a bit. What are tone indicators? Most often used in text-based communication, a tone indicator is added at the end of a message to clarify what tone said message is supposed to convey. The most popular tend to be slash S for sarcasm, slash J for joke, slash SRS for serious, and slash HJ for half-joking. This is very reminiscent of abbreviated internet slang such as lmao, gitfo, and lol, and, if anything, fills a void of function where such slang falls short. For instance, you might want to say something edgy or a bit off-kilter, and before the use of tone indicators, it was common to just add LOL at the end of such a message so as not to be taken too seriously. The problem is that this still leaves things up for heavy interpretation, especially considering that LOL has lost meaning over time. Sometimes it's used as a conversation filler when you don't have anything else to say. Sometimes it's used to get someone to take a message less seriously. Sometimes it's used after saying something awkward and, on occasion, might actually be used if you find something funny, but that task is nowadays left up to other abbreviations like LMAO and RAFFLE combined with BOLD and all caps. Speaking of which, flavor text, such as italics, bold, or capitalization, also tends to fall short when trying to do the functions tone indicators are used for these days. There was a time when these things would be used to convey sarcasm or a joke, and while better than ending a message with a casual LOL, it still leaves too much room for confusion. Basically, we were forcing our previous tools of online text-based communication to do things they weren't really meant for, and thus needed to come up with a new standard. Just like inventing a new word for a feeling that was previously hard to describe, such as hyrith, we create new syntax to make conveying tones much easier. However, like any other change in internet culture, not everyone is going to be on board, and those who lack basic understandings tend to be the loudest. While both groups suffer problems with egocentrism, the first tends to be egocentric in terms of sloppily sorting people into camps of minority and majority. This group, whom we will call majority egocentrists due to their inability to view these things from the minority lens of perspective, tend to partake in a kind of tribalism where their discomfort with social change manifests as a willingness to form teams, those who are using the new social norms, and those who aren't. A classic example are toxic types who love to point out when someone has pronouns in bio, which is a new social norm people use to ensure they're called by the correct pronouns. Eventually, this becomes a colloquialism for people they don't like, even if those people don't actually have pronouns in their bios. It's part of an internet culture of people who can't live without a folder of overused Wojak reaction images and a dictionary of playground insults like leftoid or commie. So, to follow the pattern, when another social change like tone indicators sprouts up, they go through the same cycle again. A tone indicator, just like having pronouns in your bio, isn't a particularly solid indicator of your politics or who you are as a person. It's not like conspicuous consumption, where the main reason you do it is to be overt about a part of your identity. Rather, it's a form of social adaptability to make communication easier. For the most part, it's pretty neutral. I say this because trans people aren't the only ones who put pronouns in their bios. Similarly, the use of tone indicators isn't exclusive to the neurodivergent. What majority egocentrists fail to realize is that these social adaptations benefit everyone, not just the groups they dislike. Sure, a lot of trans people put their pronouns in their bio, but a lot of cis women do the same because they don't feel comfortable with everyone on the internet defaulting to the assumption that the person they're talking to is male. Similarly, while people with autism are more likely to use tone indicators, lots of allistic individuals use it because they might not want to spend the extra time trying to decipher a message or ask for clarification, since that breaks the flow of conversation. To put it succinctly, things that benefit disabled or minority groups end up helping everyone. This is the understanding majority egocentrists lack because it's not convenient to their incorrect worldview that allows them to believe that they can instantly write off a person for participating in these new social norms. Now, moving on to the next group of egocentrists who tend to have an issue with new social norms, we get to tradition egocentrists. 
While this group similarly lacks the understanding that accessibility features are helpful to more than just the disabled, they go further and incorrectly believe that these features exist due to newer generations getting dumber over time, instead of them being a result of the natural evolution of communication. I witnessed a shining example of this in an iDubs video where Ian spent some time with the infamous right-wing media figure Sam Hyde. As a quick disclaimer, this is by no means exclusive to right-wing figureheads. Vosh also has problems conveying the difference between his serious and humorous hyperbolic statements, but let's keep the video limited to just one controversial media figure, shall we? Anyways, Sam's demeanor in the video is characterized by a heaping amount of carelessness, both as an attempt at humor, but also as a common technique to make it harder to discern whether he's being genuine in his interactions. Ian becomes uncomfortable with this, and it starts to show when they're riding around in one of Sam's cars, which he claims is unregistered, while he talks about his alcoholic father. Ian presses him on this and nervously asks him to take some effort to make it easier to show whether he's just joking or stating something factual. Sam immediately plays this off as a joke, bemoaning how autistic people need guides and a picture book to discern emotions. Sam is being a boomer in the way I tend to see it, not as a descriptor of age, but rather a mindset. By no means is Sam old enough to be a boomer, but instead he has a mindset characteristic of boomers who believe that mental health doesn't exist and is the butt of many jokes. You don't have to be adult enough to admit shortcomings or blind spots in your character if you can write off people who disagree with your views or way of expression as dumb young people or autists or whatever ad hominem that can be used as a shorthand to pretty much say, I value being comfortable in my assumptions more than being vulnerable or genuine. Make no mistake, the boomer mindset is an unhealthy coping mechanism used to avoid being genuine in conversation because that concedes the power dynamic in which the boomer has the upper hand. It would be humiliating for an older person to learn from someone younger than them because it threatens the archetype of the wise old man which boomers have become so comfortable with. It's no different than challenging a man about sexism that he's become very comfortable benefiting from. Without this boomer mindset or toxic masculinity persona, a lot of privileged groups tend to act in immature ways, especially in the workplace when confronted with issues of sexism or racism. There's a good Medium article that discusses this problem, stating that when given sensitive and diplomatic feedback, white people will just up and leave and take the criticism so poorly that, in one instance, the recipient of the criticism was showing symptoms of a heart attack. Their co-workers were worried that someone was going to literally die as a result of feedback. In the absence of a boomer mindset or toxic masculinity persona, white people will weaponize white fragility as a way of making themselves unapproachable to the point that they're trying to make you uncomfortable with raising the issue again or daring to bring it up. Sound familiar? The difference is that deflecting criticism or sensitive subjects through the toxic masculinity persona is much less embarrassing to oneself than pretending to be all fragile as soon as you're criticized. These unhealthy coping mechanisms lock tradition egocentrists in a limited worldview that focuses more on putting up walls to defend their comfort zone than understanding why these new changes exist. Because even outside of text-based communication, indicating the tone of what you're saying has become a necessity in the post-irony age, where it's damn near impossible to tell if someone has drank the Kool-Aid or is just pretending to because they're gaming a media system that gives the most attention to the most abhorrent public figures. Like, let's say... For the sake of argument, I found someone cryogenically frozen, Futurama style, from 2010, and I told them that a Hispanic Nazi went on an ironic date with a femboy and later ended up becoming so misogynistic that he bigotry Ouroboros himself into being gay because he believed that gay men are making up for the lack of femininity he believed modern women weren't doing. They'd think I was off my fucking meds, but that's the reality of discourse these days. Even in the news, comedic publications like The Onion have now inspired communities such as the subreddit r slash NotTheOnion as a way for people to laugh at the uncomfortable comedy that results from an increasingly absurd dystopia. A tradition egocentrist thinks it's appropriate for people to use the same social norms from a time when Occupy Wall Street was the craziest thing in the news, despite us now being in an age where a reality TV host became president and threw a hissy fit so large during his failed re-election that he attempted to overthrow the entire United States government. They want the problem to be young people diverging from linguistic tradition than for the problem to be that the well of discourse is so thoroughly poisoned that we need to make explicit disclaimers when we say something ridiculous. This modern post-irony age has effectively killed sarcasm, and the best way we can presently deal with it is to ruin the fun part of sarcasm, the implication, by being explicit so as not to make people uncomfortable. 
Finding a similarity between both the majority egocentrists and traditional egocentrists, it's not hard to see that they tend to be mostly white guys. They hate when you point that out too, and it's frankly ironic because they love to assume the identities of people who have pronouns in bio or use tone indicators, but when the shoe's on the other foot, they become uncomfortable with someone doing the same thing in regards to their behavior. In defense, they love to claim that being a white male doesn't make them invincible, and many right-wing figureheads love to use their recent deplatformings as an example. But Nobody said that being of the majority demographics makes you invincible. It just means you never have to think about adaptability. A white man doesn't have to consider changing how ethnic their name sounds to have a better chance of getting a job, nor do they have to think about whether it's safe to go for a walk at night, nor do they have to worry about if someone's being nice to them because they're trying to get in your pants. The main reason activists put a spotlight on the white male is not out of hate, but rather it's brought up because that majority demographic is the most likely not to understand the experience of living in a world that is uncomfortable unless it is adapted to you. Thus, when social changes arise, especially ones that make identity visible to a person who's never had to think about their own due to being constantly catered to in society, they have to have a hissy fit about it. Out of complacency in their own privilege, they don't want to think about their identity, and that includes everyone else's too. You don't see the neurodivergent or other minorities complaining about these changes because we've been made to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. When we aren't adapted to, we're basically forced to become as comfortable as we can with jumping across the gap in accessibility that never needed to be there. These new social norms help us jump that gap, so we're going to keep participating in them whether that pisses off reactionaries or not. That aside, I don't expect reactionaries to break from this pattern of trying to paint the change in social norms in a negative or tribalist light. The existence of tone indicators, along with the mixed social reception they've garnered, are surprisingly telling of how reactionaries have affected sarcasm in the modern day, and how their inelasticity to social change originates from a lack of sympathy to those outside of their ego. 